Okay, so uh, as you all know, tomorrow is the exam. And um, it's, what, it's at night, 7 p.m. The conflict is at 4.30. And here's where you should go. So uh, if you're in this sitting here right now in the in-person, you're going to Wohler's. And also, if your last name is A through K in the online, you're going through Wohler's. And here's the other locations. There's just three rooms. And um, so be sure to bring a pencil because it's Scantron. So you have to circle in those bubbles with a pencil. And you have to bring a calculator and make sure that it's a non-programmable, non-graphing calculator. We won't have any to provide for you. We don't have any extras, so be sure to bring extra batteries and, um, you know, an extra calculator if you can. Okay, so um, any questions on that? Now, down here, everybody uh, should know that here's the, the two best study materials, and I hope people have already done this study guide. If you haven't, you should do it right away and check yourself with the key, and then the best thing, way to study is then to do these practice problems as if they were a real exam without looking at your notes or the key. And here is the formulas that you, basic ones that are going to be given to you. We'll go over these in the, at the end of the uh, lecture today to maybe uh, just explain them, give you ways to remember them. And this is the only one that will be provided. So I'll talk more about the exam, how long it is. Uh, Etc. Um, but first, let's finish the lecture. So let's go to the doc. Let's start the lecture and finish the chapters that are going to be covered on the exam. All right. So let's go to the document camera right now. And let's see. Okay, so he, on page, I just want to point out one thing on page 90. So we've already covered this, and we're on the next page, but I just saw something here, and I just wanted to draw your attention to it. It said for the chi-square independence test, here's the number of degrees of freedom. That's really not the way it says the number rows. This isn't the way that we talked about it. So... The degrees of freedom for the chi-square is what? It's the number of, you have two variables, and you're trying to see if they're independent. It's the number of categories minus one, well, the number of categories in variable one minus one times the number of categories in variable two minus one. Okay, and where, as for the chi-square independence, you just have one variable, so it's the number of categories in that variable minus one. All right, so I just wanted to correct that. And one other correction, it says the observed significance level P can be approximated as the area under the chi-square to the right of the observed value. It, no, the significance level is really the null cutoff where you set that. You get an observed p, so I should say this is just the observed p-value. The significance level, the significance, the chi-squared corresponding to the significance level are right on your chi This is all I mean. This is not complicated. Let me just show you. So you have this chi square table here and you get some actual observed value of p, and then what you do is compare that observed value of p to some critical value of p at a particular cutoff. So let's say you had five degrees of freedom, and you wanted to see, you know, if your test statistic was significant. Well, this is the cutoff, the critical value for chi squared at for five degrees of freedom. So if you have a bigger one than that, you'll reject the null because you'll have a smaller p-value. These are equivalent. All these are equivalent to what we did to the cutoffs for the t or the uh, z, etc. All right, it was just a matter of wording there. Any questions on that?
on this, on this, on this I think that's the only uh, mistake on here. All right. So now we did this last time, but I just want to go over it to make sure you understand p-values. And we didn't completely fill this in. So let's just go over this again. So, um, so basically, these, this is the limitations of significance tests. People make this big deal about significance tests and these p-values, but they're, they're, they have a lot of limitations. So one is, the first one is, that they don't tell you whether something is really practically significant to you, whether you care about it. All it does is it tells you that it's statistically significant. So that just means what? They can only tell you whether or not a difference is likely to do to chance, not whether it's important. OK? Not whether there's causation or anything. It just says that it wasn't due to chance, which means what? Which means that with a large enough sample, any difference, no matter how much you can, any difference, no matter how tiny it is, can be found to be sig statistically significant. Because think of our um, test statistics, like the Z. We, you know, it's some difference over a standard error. Well, we can make that standard error as small as we want by just increasing the sample size, right? So if you have a huge sample size, you'll find anything to be significant, even though it might be totally trivial, all right? It does not make the difference important, so remember that. Because the word sig significant seems really important, and statistics seems like, oh, you know, the gold standards there. We got statistical significance, but it can be totally meaningless in it to, to most people, even though it's statistically significant. That's all I want you to say. And the example was, um, you know, just a difference of one point, what was it? A difference of one point in IQs is pretty meaningless. I mean, even if it was real, who cares about it? But if you have a big enough sample size, you're going to get significant. Even if it was a difference of 0. 0.0001, it's, you're going to get statistical significance if you sampled enough people. OK? All right, that's all that is about. And also, let's say we don't get significant statistical significance. Let's say our p-value is bigger than 5%. And it might be because our sample size is too small. And very important differences, things you really care about, may not show up because our, uh, may not show up to be statistically significant because the statistics are weak. They don't have a high enough power. We're going to look at this next, uh, in the next section. It's called underpowered because the sample sizes are too small. We don't have a good enough detection system. We just need more, you know, it might be a very important one. So that's what you should keep in mind. Now, there's another huge problem with significance tests is that they're easy for people to cheat or to what's called p-hack. You've probably seen this word, p-hacking. People can really um, do a lot of cheating by basically the idea, the idea is it says with enough tests, significant results will appear by chance. So what does that mean? Basically, if you, if you run tons of tests or sift through it, lots of data, do all this data mining looking for patterns, well, there's going to, and then just cherry picking where you find significance or a pattern and say, and don't report how long it took you to find that and act as if you had the hypothesis before you looked at that data, well, then that's cheating. Think about it. It's, I talked about it before. Uh, if I asked all of you, hundreds of people, to guess a number, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Well, there's a 5% chance just by the luck of the draw, right? So we could say if somebody discovered the, the, somebody thought of the number, you could say, hey, it passed the 5% you know, significance test. But if I asked tons of people, of course, just by the luck of the draw, a bunch of them are going to get that number, right? 100 people, five of them just by chance will. The point is, you have to. I'd have to pick out that one person and run the test on that person. You have to have a test 
and then collect the data. You know, have a hypothesis and then collect the data. You can't look through all this data and find significance or run all these tests. All right? That's called p-hacking, so let's look at this. So beware of, if you run 100 tests, you expect five to result in statistical significant results, even when the null is true. That's the whole point. When we're just looking for when the null is true, you're going to find 5% of the results to be significant. So beware of claims of significant results when many tests are run. Okay? Or we're, you know, or, so basically, you have to report how many tests were run. And people don't always do that. These days, journals are asking people, are trying to be much more vigilant about it. There's a lot of publicity about this. So we must report, but a lot of people don't do that. The point is you can't just look over all the data and, you know, cherry pick. Just pick out the ones you want, the significant results. Because they're always going to be there just by the luck of the draw. And just say, hey, that's the only test I ran, or imply that it was. Okay, so here's a case of, um, of something like that. Um, or you also can't look through masses of data and for looking for patterns. And then when you find one, say it's statistically significant because just by the luck of, you know, you're going to find that even when nothing's going on. So liver cancer is a rare disease, which may sometimes be caused by environmental pollutants. The chance of having two or more cases in a given year in a town of 10,000 is very small. It's only 0.5%. So people, when people find one, they think, uh, oh, there must be. It's such a tiny little percentage. There must be pollutants there, right? Because, you know, it certainly would be significant. So a cluster of liver cancer, several in a small community, prompts a search for causes like a contaminated water supply. So let's just think of what the EPA might be doing now. I mean, the, the what they have to guard against. Suppose an EPA Environmental Protection Agency reviews the incidence of liver cancer in 100 towns of this size over a 10-year period, looking for possible environmental contaminant, contaminants. How many clusters would you expect them to find by chance, even if none of the towns were contaminated? So basically, how, mu how many are they looking at? They're looking at 100 towns, right, times 10 years, over a 10-year period. So what is that? So that's a thousand town year combinations. A thousand town, okay? So how many would we expect? So we'd expect just by chance 0.5% of 1,000, which is equal to five clusters. That's how many we'd expect, even when there's no I just by chance, even when all the towns are clean, nothing's causing it, it's just by chance. So basically, you can't look through masses of data, um, and when you find a pattern, you know, say that's statistically significant. So this is cheating, okay? So basically this is called um, p-hacking is the word for it, and it's cheating. p-hacking, data snooping, there's lots of different words for it. It's all cheating. And it's a problem. All right. So, um, you can just look it up on Wikipedia. There's probably something very, I'm sure there's stuff about it. It's all over the news. Okay, so now let's see what else. Here's another example. Here's like an ESP example. Okay, an experiment on ESP is repeated a thousand times. All right, suppose there's no ESP and the experiment's done correctly. How many, about how many of the experiments would you expect to find? Okay, so 
statistically significant. All right? So we'll say at 5% significance level. That's the conventional. So what would we do? We'd say 5% of 1,000. So that's 0 0.05 times 1,000, which is equal to 50. So you'd expect 50 of them. What does that mean? 50 will show e evidence of ESP when there is no ESP. That's, you know, extrasensory mind reading. So um, it's another example of that. All right, now, what about this 5%? Where does that come from? Probably just because we're in base 10, we have five fingers, right? If we had six fingers, it would probably be 6%. That's how arbitrary it is. Seriously. It has nothing to do with anything mathematical. Does a p-value mean something? So come on. Um, no. 5% <laughs> is simply a convention. We'll see, right, we'll see in the next chapter that often 5% is the wrong one. You wouldn't want to choose 5% significance. It really depends on the situation. So 5% is simply a convention. Um, you know, like a 90% cutoff for an A. Is there really a difference between 89.999 and 90.111? But in the old system, when we didn't even give pluses and minuses, one got, group got an A and the other got a B. It was terrible. I think you should just report the significance level. You should just report the percentage, especially in a math class. I hate doing those grades. And it's just, you know, you love it when you're above the cutoff, but it sucks when you're not. This is basically it. And same with these stupid p-values. And they're not, you know, people like to make decisions. They want to draw a cutoff. And that's all this is about. All right. Simply convention, no mathematical justification for it. It's just human nature to want to draw the line somewhere, black and white. And sometimes we have to. All right. Um, there's certainly, think of the curve. What are we, how do we arrive at this? Think of the sampling distributions of our test statistic. That's what we're doing here. Let's say it was a Z test, but all of them are like this. They're not going to have a sharp cutoff. There's the, this is what the curve is going to look like, right? And then this 5% is just right here. Is there really a difference between, you know, is it like this is your 5%? Is there really a difference between there and there? No. You know? They're curves. We have curves. The distributions are curves like that. They're not cliffs. They're not, we're treating it as if they're a cliff, like, okay, all of a sudden, you know, this is, all of a sudden, whoops, we get 5% and it's, we're in a completely different situation. They're not like that. that. That's what, you know, it's not like that. This side, we're fine, and then all of a sudden, we fall off a cliff. All right, so that's the idea. And now we're going to look at this, what this p-value means, and really, there's a tra this is a type 1 error, these p-values. And we have to weigh that against another type of error called a type 2 error. And see which one, you just have to weigh the uh, costs of making those two types of errors. So let's look at that in the next section. All right. So here is chapter 18 will be on the exam. So we're talking about, we've been talking about this type 1 error, right? That type 1 error is our p-value. Okay, that's what that is. That's the type 1, it's our p-value, it's alpha, it's the significance level. It's like that 5% cutoff. That's this, conventionally set at 5%. Okay? 
So that's, I'll just say usually, for no reason, set at 5%. Okay? That's what this is. It's our null cutoff. That's the only type of error we've been looking at so far. This is what we've been doing, right? But, and when, and this can only occur when the null is true, right? This occurs, like, let's just go down here. So what we've been doing, let's draw a picture of it, when the null is true, like this, we'll draw a picture, we've been setting this null cutoff, so right here. This is a sampling distribution of our test statistic that shows evidence of whether the null is true or not. And when it's so far out on the tail, we say, hey, we're going to reject this. That's what we do. That's all we've been doing. This is null cutoff. And this right here is our type 1 error. Why is this? It's alpha. Our type 1 error. Why is it an error? Because when the, this is when the null is true. We're going to see this. So if we decide to reject the null, when it's true, we're making an error. Like, let's say the null was um, that there's was some quality control experiment where you're, like, looking at defective. Uh, I'll just, let's just do a real simple example. Let's say it was a smoke alarm, OK? So when the null is true, if this was a smoke alarm, what would it mean? Null is true, so there'd be no fire. Right? So this is the probability of our smoke alarm, a false alarm, our smoke alarm going off when there's no fire. Okay? Well, that's not very serious. Right? It's a false alarm. Okay, so let's write. But there's another type of error. Okay? So the significance level is the probability of mistakenly rejecting the null when the null is true. So that's why it's called an error. We made a mistake. And we set it low to keep the chances of making a type 1 error small. But there's another kind of error we can make. What's that? Let's say the null really is false. Let's say there is a fire, right? Then we'd want our significance test to, you know, correctly detect that fire, to reject the null and detect a fire that's really there. So a type 2 error occurs when the null is false, there really is a fire, right? And yet our test fails to reject it. It says, it just here, for example, let's, do, let's draw it. What happens is there's going to be, we're making a decision between two competing hypotheses. Here's when the null is true, and we haven't considered when the null is false. That's what we haven't done yet. There's another sampling distribution when the null is false. And there's uncertainty because the two distributions overlap, OK? So there's another whole distribution when the null is false. Let's say that distribution, let's say it followed the same, we're using the same detection system. And let's say it looked something like this. So this would be when the null is false or when the alternative is true. Let's say there's just one alternative. You either have a fire or you don't. You don't have a whole range. So this is fire. OK? This is fire. Now look what happens. Yeah, we made this error. That's our type 1 error. But there's another type of error. When we reject the null, we're making the wrong decision. We're saying, yes, there's a fire, and we're right on this distribution. But what if we don't reject the null? What if it's like right there? Like on this side, we're not going to reject the null. This side will reject, and great, we detected the fire. But what about on this side? Look at this. That's the other type of error, and that's called beta. That's the type 2 error. When we're really in this situation, our test fails to go in the right direction. They made a decision towards no fire when there's really a fire. So that's called beta. 
And the power of the test, when I said that statistics might be too weak if you have a weak test, this power to detect an effect that's really there isn't strong enough. So this is the power. This is beta on this side till the end of this distribution is beta. And all this is our power of our test to detect an effect that's really there. So if it adds up to 1 or 100 percent, the area under the curve, this is 1 minus beta. And this is called the power. From here on in is the power. And that's on this curve. OK? So there's two types of mistakes. You could only make, when the null's true, there's, you, the only mistake you can make is, re, is rejecting it, right? Right here, that's our, but when the alternative's true, there's another type of mistake you can make. So let's write that down. That's the idea. OK, so this is a very simple case where there's just no fire or fire. In most, and that's all we're going to look at in chapter 18. Most cases, it's like a drug, right? Like the drug doesn't work or it works. But what do you mean works? It can work curing 10% of the people, 20%. There's a whole range of possible alternatives. There's only one that, where it doesn't work, but there's a whole range. That's um, the idea um, in chapters, later chapters. But right now, we're just looking at the simplest case where there's one is true or the other. So now let's go back to here and write. So, so there's another type of mistake we can make. Let's say the null is false. And we'd like our si significance test to correctly reject, go that way, right? To correctly reject the null, a false null. So let's write this out. This is important. A type 2 ha error happens when the null is false. It only happens when the, when the null is false. And a type 1 error only happens when the null is true. OK? So the probability of making that is beta. We said that. All right. We want, OK, so now let's just write that down. The alpha, which is equal to basically our p-value cutoff. That's the same thing. Our significance level. Right? It's the same. It's is equal to what? It's also called a type 1 error. It is an error. That's why we want it to be small. And it's equal to a false alarm. That's what we'll think of it as. It's a false alarm. The reason why we, the 5% is journals don't, are getting bombarded with so many papers. Everybody wants to discover a cure. That's like rejecting the null, no cure. They want to discover something. So they just get bombarded with so many, um, so they just say, hey, don't even show it to me. We're not even going to look at it unless it's under a certain percentage. We don't want any of these false alarms. So that's why it's set sort of that way. It's just political reasons for that. Of course, if it was a, I mean, we might not want it to be. I'll go into that later. OK, so now, but what's the type 2 error? That is called beta. And that's the type 2 error. And what is that? That's the probability of failing to reject the null when the, when the alternative is true. Let's just call it when the alarm fails to go off, when there really is a fire. The other, see, a type 2 error, OK. So um, and then what's 1 minus beta? That's called the power. And think of it as the power to detect an effect, like a fire, when it's really there. All right, so one thing I want to point out is um, we'd like both types of errors to be low, but there's a trade-off. 
Lowering one raises the other. Why? Let's think about it. Okay. Let's say we lower this type one error so we don't have any false alarms when we're cooking, but look what would happen. We'd raise, we just have one, the, the point is we just have one detection system. So for this detection system, here's sort of, this is the distribution of some evidence for whether there's a fire or not. So this could be some kind, I don't know, you know, some kind of smokiness in the air. So this measures the smoke in the air, right? So think about it. Okay, so when there's no fire, there's not usually, mo there's always maybe some smoke, air pollution, whatever. Sometimes you get really clear, crystal clear, no smoke at all. But there's some level, right? But then if you get beyond that, maybe you're cooking and you don't really have a fire. You're just frying up some food and then it's not a fire, but the smoke alarm goes off. So that would be this error right here. That happens all the time. Now, when there really is a fire, this same detection system that detects how much smoke in the air is, um, when there really is a fire, this has a different distribution, right? You have much more smokiness in the air. But sometimes you have these errors because it can be like a smoldering fire that doesn't give off much smoke for, or something. And then you're, you're way down here and your um, detection system doesn't detect it. Now, of course we want both errors to be low, right? So what we'd like to do is build a better smoke alarm, which would just mean what? Narrowing these, making it more precise. So lowering our standard deviation or standard error, making it like that. And then we'd separate the two curves. But short of that, given the particular detection system, what can we do? All we can do is shift around this. So there's a trade-off, that's the problem, between the two types of errors. So in this case, I want you to think about it, in this case, you have to think which type of error is more costly, which is worse. Because you can change your cutoff. Well, this error says there's a fire and it, you know, it didn't go off and people could be killed. So you want, I think in this case, the beta is much worse. You want that to be as small as possible, which is how smoke alarms are set, which is why they, they're annoying and go off all the time. Does that make sense? Which is worse, sorry. Don't you think it's worse if your smoke alarm didn't go off and you're sleeping in the, middle, in, in the night and you die? That's worse. So with all these quality control things, they set this, they care more about the type two error. Think about an airplane, a defective part of an airplane. What's the null? The null is the airplane's fine. The landing gear's fine. Let's say landing gear, right? And, you know, there's certain distribution of how, you know, they're gonna detect all these different measurements of the strength of whatever. And they have this one detection, they have this detection system, and it's going to set, set off some, you know, red flags, some alarms, if there's something fishy about it. Well, we want, you know, that happens all the time. How many of you have been, for good reason, how many times have you been stuck on the runway because there's some problem and it's a false alarm? It turns out it's okay, right? Because the cost of that is just a few hours of time. But what if you, so it's set way down here, to make this type error as tiny as possible, because otherwise the plane flies and crashes. Does that make sense? So in that, in all these quality control, the cost of making a type two error is usually much worse than type one. But to get accepted for a journal, the standard is, to get your paper accept, accepted for a journal, the standard is 5% here, and 20% type 2 error, so only an 80% power to detect an effect that's really there, which sometimes drives me crazy because what if it's a testing a drug? It could save people's lives, right? You should think about what it's doing. It saves people's lives, and it just is, the sample size isn't big enough. That's all. It's underpowered. 
Well, we really want to detect a different, that drug, if it's really, you know. And sometimes we, it, a possible cure, if it really is there, we want to detect that. And sometimes it's just too costly to get a big enough sample size. So you really have to think of the trade-offs. And this stupid 5% just drives me crazy. I know that's what people use, and you're probably taught if it's 5% or below, reject the null, the null, some, the null um, you know. But I don't want you to stick by it. OK, for the exam, yes, I'll, for most, you know, for the exam, I'll say the conventional 5%. OK, so let's move on and go on with this. Um, what else do we need to know? All right, so sometimes it's just easy to put it into this little chart. Right? So basically, in all these cases, we're making a decision under uncertainty. There's overlap between our two curves. That's the problem. There's overlap. We're not sure. We never know for certain what the real truth is. It exists. There is some truth. And here's our decision. So whatever we decide, we always run the risk of making either a type 1 or type 2 error. And you should think about what the costs are, the competing costs of those. What are the consequences of such error? Let's get an intuitive picture of both errors. So here's a chart here, right? So either, so, all right, H naught is false. That means the alternative is true. So there's a real effect. There's a positive. The disease is really there. There's some, something's really happening. Here, there's a real effect, and when the null is true. The null is the null dull. There's no effect. OK, so negative. All right, now when we reject the null and we decide on that side, we say, hey, there's a real effect. So that's, we decide there is a real effect. That's positive. And when we fail to reject the null, we just think, oh, there's nothing going on. There's no effect. It's just the null dull. We don't have enough evidence to reject it. There's nothing going on. So of course, where are the mistakes here? Well, this is positive and positive. Yeah, when, there is, when there's an effect, we want to decide for the effect. And that's great. That's our power. But what if there's an effect, there's a fire, and we say there's no effect? Well, what is that? That's a type 2 error. And another word for it is what? A false. We're saying there's nothing there when there is a false negative. OK? And here, well, we could be in this situation where the no, there's nothing going on, right? There's nothing going on. And that's great. We don't reject that. We say there's nothing going on. That's fine. But what if we do, what if we decide for the alternative? Well, that's the type 1 error. That's what we usually set to begin with. And we say there's an effect. We say positive, but it's not true. So that's a false positive. So that's how you can think of it. All right. So so look at the chart. So in a randomized clinical trial, the null is always a no effect, right? Um, that the treatment didn't work. In a jury trial, the null is the person's innocent. In a diagnostic test, the null would be that the person is healthy, no disease. You can think of it as no, null, no, no disease. All right. So we can only make this type 1 error right here. We can only make a type error when the null is true. We can only make the other one when the null is false. All right, so this is what we did here. I think we did this jury trial. Again, here's the trade-off. You might just want to look at this again. All right, so there's this trade-off. All right, so here the person is innocent, right? And there's some, we're using the same evidence. You know, whatever evidence we use, it's this, the same measuring stick whether the person, you know, we don't know if he's innocent or guilty. And there's, so let's say it's some, you know, we've got a lot of evidence against the person. And at some point we say, okay, beyond a reasonable doubt, there's our null cutoff and that's alpha. 
But then we have to consider when the people are guilty, well, we're using that. Some people are really slick and aren't going to have much evidence. They know how to hide it. And those are the people that are guilty, but we let free. So they're both terrible mistakes, right? You don't want to put innocent people in jail, and you don't want to let guilty people free. So I think of it as like it would probably be situation so we can move this cutoff back and forth. And I'd think, well, if it was just a traffic violation, right, a traffic violation, maybe I don't mind. It's not such a big deal to be fined, and it will make for safer roads. And, um, you know, having people killed in accidents is terrible. So maybe we should move this that way, right, where we can let, where we get all the guilty people so they don't, you know, drive, endanger other people's lives. But what if it's a death penalty case? You're, you know, this is like the people you're going to, if you have the, um, you're going to kill. These are your mistakes. You can never bring them back. So there you have to make go really far out this way because you could always, you know, they'll never come back. That, that decision's final and you've killed somebody innocent. So that's a very, very, that should, alpha should be really small there. And it's too bad we're going to let guilty people go, but this seems worse to kill innocent people. To me, it's a judgment call. So um, how can you lower both errors? Let's think about it. Right now, we can just slide them, right? We can just slide them. Like if we want, I'm such a softy that basically when it came to cheating, I was doing this until I figured out ways to stop it because I really didn't want to accuse people of cheating because they get kicked out of the university. Don't cheat on the exam. I have a good detection system now. I'll catch you. But I was letting way too many guilty people free. Way too many. So what I did was develop a better cheating detection system. Basically, you're going to get identical ex exams that look identical. And I'm telling you about it so you don't cheat. They look identical, but they're not. Some, the little numbers are switched, so they have different answers, so I can catch people when they cheat. And so now, what have I done? I've made a much better detection system that doesn't have nearly as much error as just looking to see whether somebody glances at somebody else's paper. And so basically, what I've done is narrow these two curves. So I'm not, so I'm either, so I basically spread these apart. So how can you lower, that's the only way to lower both types of errors. How can you lower both types of errors? Well, build a better mousetrap, basically. Build a better detection system, which means less error, less overlap of the curves. A better detection system, and you can do that how? by lowering the standard deviation of the curve, the standard error of the curve. Okay. You can lower it by the standard deviation of the machine, or in cases where you're doing a randomized trial, increasing n. We'll look at that where in the next few chapters. So less overlap. If we have a chance to do them, we might not. OK, so lowering the SE, that's the same as the SD. OK, for this system. More people aren't gonna, isn't going to help if you, have, if you can't improve your equipment here. I'm just talking about a different situation where we have, a lot of, we have lots of alternatives. Or we can lower the error by having more people. Any questions on this? Um, so that's the basic idea. Is that the end of this chapter? Yeah. All right, we can review now for the exam. I think that's pretty much the end. Um, you should read this. All right, so here we should fill this in. What is it? When there's nothing's going on, this is a false positive, and you make an error. And when the null is false, right? Oops, 
We've got it. I got the things wrong. This is when the null is false, when there's a real effect. Yes, so that's a false. So when we, fall, oh yeah, I got it right. False negative, and this is a false positive. Boy, you can confuse yourself, can't you? You really can. This is the false alarm. Think of it that way. It's an alarm. False alarm when the null is true. False alarm. I'm going to put that in. I think that's easier to remember. A false alarm. Oh, you have cancer when you don't. Okay. All right. Now that's it. And what should we do now? All right. So let's think about first. Let's try to figure out what to do. All right. So how many of you, just a show of hands, I'm curious, have done the study guide? How many of you have done the practice problems? All right. Does anybody have any, before I start those people who have done, does anybody have any burning questions about those? Any questions on the study guide or on the practice problems that they want me to go over? OK. Well, then what should I do? Well, let's look. Maybe we should look at. These. Do you want to look at these formulas you need to know? And then just find some basic ways so you can absolutely remember them. Start there. It won't take us long. OK? That won't take us long. All right. So what do you need to know? Standard deviation, right? You definitely need to know that. Just a very simple case. And I'm not going to, you need to know that. Um, you know, I don't have to go over that, do I? How to compute a standard deviation? Know that the deviations sum to what? What do they sum to? You have positive and negative sum to zero. So you have to square the deviations to get the standard deviations. You square the deviations. You get all those deviations. You square them. You square the deviations. Then you take their average by dividing by how many there are, and then you take their square root. And you can practice that. All right, what other formula do you need to know there? Um, you know how to take an average. You know what the median is. You know those. Uh, let's look at an example here. That should be important. Let's see. Where am I looking? OK, for sure, for sure you know how to get these areas here on page 8 of the histogram. Do like something like that. You definitely need to know um, compute percentages here, et cetera. You need to know, um, all right, that's not really a formula. Here's a, OK, here. You need to know that the, they sum to 0 on the previous page. And here's how you would compute like this problem. Um, and then, of course, these aren't formulas, but these are things you should know. What happens to the average and the standard deviation when you add a constant to all of them? So this page, for sure, for the descriptive statistics, and do something like this, for sure. OK, those are just for starters. Now, what are the formulas for descriptive statistics? Um, well, there's the normal approximation, right? There's the z. There's the z, which isn't only used for the normal approximation. You, the z can you be used for anything? Value minus average over the standard deviation. You can compute a z-score for anything, but you can only use the normal approximation when the data follows the normal curve. I'm not talking about inference. I'm just talking about actual data. What am I talking about? Can you use a normal approximation here? No. Why? You can compute z-scores, but you can't use a normal approximation to figure these areas. We have to, because this, the normal approximation, our data doesn't look like the normal curve. So we can't approximate it with the normal curve. All right? Understand. All right. So what else? That's 
you need to know. Um, what else did we have? Since we're right here, I'm going to distinguish this from the z-score for random variables. That's different. Then you can get for random variables. These are just for numbers. Then for random, for what do I mean random variables? Numbers drawn from a chance process, generated by a chance process. So for numbers, you get generated by a chance process, like drawing out of a box at random tickets. Those are called random because you're randomly selecting them for a chance process, random variables. Those are the same thing. Um, then we have another, for averages, sums, and percents, we have another type of z. Okay? So the z is equal to what? Our value, and instead of an average, we, because it's a chance process, it changes all the time, right? It's a chance. So it's an expected value, right? And then instead of straight standard error, that's going to change depending on how many draws you take. So that's called a sampling error. They're generated by a chance process, so they depend on the sample. So you've got the sampling error, standard error, right? And that, why can we use the normal curve here? Because of the central limit theorem, we can use the normal curve. Because even if the data looks like this and isn't normal, at all, if we're sampling from data that looks like that, the average, the sampling distribution of the average will look normal, and the sampling distribution of the, you know, so basically that's the idea, okay? So you can use a normal approximation even when the data itself doesn't look normal. All right, so how do we get this expected value? So this is situations where you've got, we're using this in situations where we've got a population and a sample. Okay, so formulas for this you need to know. The standard error formulas, and how are you going to know them? Okay, so these, this is always for random variables, so we've got some population, and we're drawing samples from it, right? We're taking samples, and we want to know how these samples bounce around. So our standard error formulas. Okay, the standard error, it's, a stand, it's like a standard deviation. It depends on the standard deviation of the box. If the box all had one number, you wouldn't have any, you'd always get the same thing. As long as you have a spread of numbers, and the more spread out there in here, the more uncertainty there is what you're gonna draw. So the bigger your standard deviation in the box, that's the same as sigma, the bigger your standard error formulas, right? But they also depend on n. So every standard error formula depends on SD, and you either multiply or divide by how many by your sample size, n. But it's not n; it's that famous square root law. These are the it's the square root of n, right? So this. All right, so that's the central limit theorem and the square root law, two most important laws in statistics. All right, so now let's do them. So we have what? A standard error for the sum of n draws from some box. And when do we use this? We use this usually for games of chance, like gambling. Right, that's what we use this for usually. And that, again, is the standard deviation now, do you think we're going to multiply or divide by the square root of n? We're summing things up. So what's going to happen? Multiply. Yes, this is all you have to remember. Multiply because it's the sum, square root of n. Now, for sampling, usually we're not interested in the sum total of everybody's exam scores or the sum total of everybody's weight. or the, We're interested in the average or the percent, right? So the standard error for the average, for the sample average, how that's going to bounce around, or the sample percent, this is for zero, one boxes, is 
is equal to what? Again, you see standard error, standard deviation is the first thing that should pop into your mind. Okay? Now, an average. To get an average, do you multiply or divide by, by n to get an average? To get an average, don't you divide by n? So you're going to divide by the square root of n. That's all you're going to do. These are both really averages. That will give you the decimal for a percent, but you have to multiply by 100 to change it to a percent. So there's your standard error formulas. Now, for these 0, 1 boxes, this SD is what? This is the shortcut formula. So for percent problems, for 0, for 0, 1 boxes, what is your, your SD? It's super easy, and I don't want anybody to forget it. It's just the square root of the p times 1 minus p, where the, as decimals. The fraction that are 1s as a decimal time, you can do it as a fraction. It's the same thing. Where, where are you going to find this? This is the shortcut formula. It's a shortcut formula that you, and where is that shortcut formula? Let's look for it in your notebook because... I think there's also a time where you're going to have to use it not f when the numbers aren't just 0 or 1. So let's find it and make sure you understand it. Where do we do that? Shortcut formula. For just, it was in the just two types of tickets. Shoot, I'm sorry, I can't. Does anybody know the page that it's on? Why am I having trouble finding it? Sorry. What page? 52. The shortcut formula is on 52? Oh, 50. All right, here we go, page 50. This is what I'm talking about, okay? Or you could just look at the, it's the fraction, okay, so you know how to do this. It's like, it would be, you know, it's A minus B times the fraction of A ticks times that. Maybe you could just skip to the notation. I bet it's here and it will help you faster. Yeah, here we go. So here we have it in symbols, and here we're talking about right here. This right here, standard deviation sigma, is the square root of p times 1 minus p. We can use that shortcut formula here. See, it's the same as it, because it's 1 minus, it's just equal to, usually it's some numbers on the tickets times the fraction of tickets with, should we just do an example? Let's just do an example right down here. So if you don't have ones and zeros on the tickets, let's say you have um, a two and a zero, okay? So then what would be your SD? Your SD is equal to two minus zero times one half times one half. Fraction of tickets with one number times, there's just one tiny little question on this. I shouldn't be spending so much time on it. With second number. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Questions? I don't want to like get off on, you should know this already. Okay? This will, just comes up in gambling or guessing games. When there's, in percent problems, you do the same thing. If you do the same thing in a percent problem, you have a 1 and a 0. And this comes up all the time. Then your standard deviation is 1 minus 0. And why even bother with that? And it's easier for me to just think of it as like a decimal now is like 0.5 times 0.5, which is equal to 0.5. Because they're, they're given to you as percents, usually. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so let's move on. So now, where are we? So these are the formulas. What other formulas do you need to know? Standard error of the difference. Okay, so let's move on to that. So what about the expected values here? Is there anything? The only one that has a formula is this one, the sum, because the expected value for the sum is n times the average of the box. The other ones don't have formulas. They're the same. As the sample is going to be the same as the box, the, the average. The expected value for the sample will be the same as the box. What else would you expect? It's just this one depends on the number of draws. Okay? And then what else do we need to know? After that, um, what did we do? We use the normal curve again to figure chance. Know what a probability histogram is, right? Like if you have two draws from some, do we have any examples? Let's see. You do need to, I, let's see if we do probability histogram like, like these, right? No, what do you need to know? Well, this is just going to be the sum of two draws from this box. Why? Because the highest you can get is a 10, and the lowest you can get is a 0, right? And this shows the possibilities. Excuse me, this is just one draw from the box. This is just one draw. This is just for the box. One draw, the highest you can get. But what about two draws? Here's two draws from the box in taking the sum. Because now the highest you can get is 20 when you take sum them, 10 plus 10, and the lowest you can get is 0, and etc. And so do you see as you get more draws, it starts looking like the normal curve. How many draws is this one? Okay, does that make sense? You need to know, understand that. Any questions on that? All right, what else? What comes next? Hmm. Okay, now we're moving on to sampling, right? So for sampling, what do we have? You need to know, um, of course, randomized is best. Random sampling, you know that, I'm sure. Um, Confidence intervals, right? Do you understand those, how to get confidence intervals for different percents? You need to know those, um, et cetera. But you know what? I'm not going in order here. I was just, I was, I did this because I wanted to relate these two. So let's go back to the order, okay, so I don't skip anything. I just wanted to relate for numbers and for um, random variables. But I skipped some stuff. What did I skip? I skipped the normal approximation. Just for, for numbers, we've been doing the normal curve so much, but you do need to know how to get, if I gave you um, uh, some value, and you need to, you know, you'd have to go through the z-score to get the percentile. And if I give you a percentile, you need to go through the z-score to get the value. So basically always get the z-score. So always change to a z-score. And the only the percentile one's harder for people. You got some percentile here. So how do you change it to a z-score? So you, you have this, this is the 50th percentile, so you're given some percentile. Let's say it was 80th. That's all this. You have to get this, you have to get the z-score here. So you just look up what? The middle area for what? 30 and 30. So you'd look up middle area equals 60%. And you'd get your z-score. Does, do I have to go on with this? No. Okay, so that's the normal approximation. 
What else do you need to know? This, there are only a few questions on everything. I should tell you the exam is only, only 70 questions long, 70 bubbles you have to fill in. 70 to 73. I'm not sure. I haven't. 70 to 73 questions. Eight pages. Some of those are really easy questions. There aren't that many. That's including all the parts. So it is long, but the questions are pretty simple and easy. Basically, I wrote the exam, showed it to the TAs, and they said it's way too hard, way too long. So I just rewrote it last night. Now I think it's too easy, but I don't think you'll complain. Those TAs are on your side. They're there, and they don't want to, you know, they say, no, we can't do that, no. So we took out it, we changed it. So now it's much easier. All right, so moving on. What came after descriptive statistics? We did probability. So know all those rules, multiplication, addition. Oh, come on, you know this, addition. Basically, OK, the two strange ones. Know the probability of at least, they're going to be on there, one, and not all. OK, so what else do we need to know in the last? So that and, um, hmm, and what did we do after that? We did the box models. What's the key thing there um, for gambling? Games of chance, make it for a single play. For surveys. Um, make polls, all that stuff, make box for whole population. Okay, then what did we do after that? Um, that's where the expect, this is where all those expected values come. That's what I was talking about, you know. So you absolutely need, to, this is where you're going to need to know your ones for sum. Okay, and these, of course, you need to know the standard error for the average and percent. Okay, now what are we going to do? Oh, what else? What came after that? Then, after we did this, these box models, then we talked about confidence intervals, right? All right, so after this, you need to know confidence intervals. So what is a confidence interval? You get a point, you take a sample, you get some sample stat. That's your point estimate. And then you want to know how confident you are that your population, let's say it's an average, that your population average is um, equal to that, or well, the chance that it's exactly equal to your sample is zero, but you exactly equal. But you put some error bars around that. So you have to put some range, some wiggle room. So you make a confidence interval, right? You have a point estimate. So for example, this is the most popular one. This is what you'll see the most, a 95% confidence interval. That's for the whole population. The population you're sampling from is equal to this point estimate, your sample stat. So this is the parameter. This is your sample stat. But that language isn't so important, but there it is. I mean, not, it's important, but I don't think I put it on the test much. OK, so there it is. Sample stat, and here's your confidence. That's going to be your sample stat. And then you have to put this wiggle room around it called a margin of error. You just have to put error bars around it, margin of error. And what is that? For the 95%, if you're using the Z, you can just use 2 because the area between, I'm running out of space. You can use two. Why? Because this is where it's coming from between 
2 and negative 2 on the normal curve, you have 95%, right? So that's where that comes. Times what? Standard error. You absolutely need that. And that, okay? And that matches what your stat is. If this is an average, you think, okay, then this would be the standard error for the average. Any questions on that? Now, what about for a T? What are you going to do? When you would use a T, let's say you have a small sample and you don't know. Actually, I'm going to, I think I'm going to tell you when to use the T for this. But So when you need for T, small sample, normal or close to normal population. So that completely eliminates never zero, one boxes. Are they normal? Never percent problems. No. The box looks like this. 0 and 1. So never use the T for 0, 1 boxes because it violates that. Never use, and that's going to be on there, never use T for percent problems for 0, 1 boxes. Okay, and small sample normal population, and this is the most important one, unknown sigma. And when you have 0, 1 boxes, you have a very good estimate of sigma from your sample. And you do, that's the other reason you don't use it. Okay, so you use the T. Then, what would we get for our confidence interval? Same thing. What would we do? Well, then you say it's the same thing. 95% confidence interval is equal to your, this doesn't change. Your, this is the sample stat, and now it will be a T stat. So we'll use SD plus over the square root of N for the The, t, the statistic is the same. This is for the, I'm, I'm sorry, the statistic. Let's say you get an average of whatever you get the average for. Uh, that's going to be the same. Let, let's say you get an average of 80 for our exams. What's different is the standard error. So it's the same sample stat. But now you use plus or minus, and you have two things here. You have a different standard error. Now you have the standard error plus, And this is for the t distribution. So we'll, we'll just use a t. So you don't know this. I don't know this. This is like depends on the degrees of freedom. So you have to look at the t-curve and find these t-critical values, right, for your degrees of freedom, which is n minus 1. So that's what you've got to do. It's more complicated. So what would you do? You would just go to, it's the same sample statistic in both cases. This part doesn't change. You get a sample statistic. It's what changes is this and these critical values. This is z star, which is just one of them, but this right here is t star. And then you need to know the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So let's look that up. So let's say, do you know how you do this? Do you want me to do, you want me to do it? Okay. So let's say n, n is, pick an n, I don't know, 10. So then you'd look for degrees of freedom equals 9. And we'd do what? We'd go to the t-curve. This is exactly the curve you're going to get on your, they're going to be the same three charts, the same tables. You'll get the normal, the t, and the chi-squared. And I look just for 10, right? And I want 95% in the middle, so it's 2.23. That makes for a wider confidence interval. When I stick that in here, do you see how my confidence interval gets wider for t? More uncertainty, yeah. Well, no, you should look it up for the Z, too. It's just I happen to know that you can use, for 95%, I'm letting you use 2 instead of 1.96. Yeah, so you don't have to. You can just go to the nearest line on the table. Let's say it was a 92% confidence interval. You'd use 1.75. Okay? So, yeah. But the basic one you're going to see is 95%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
What? Did I do 10? Oh, minus, oh, I got a point off on the exam. What did I do wrong? Look what I did. I'm so, I didn't do that on purpose, but it's good I did it. N is equal to 10. So what, where should I look here? Degrees of freedom equals what? You're going to get an extra point on the exam for that. 10 minus 1. Thank you. You're such a sweetheart for noticing that. Okay. So then I go up here, and how does it change? Instead of 2 point, instead of looking right there, where do I do? 2.26. Awesome. Oh, now you're waking me up. That was so good. All right. 2.26. And let us change that. Woohoo. It's multiple choice, so maybe I should include that on the, as the wrong answer. I think I will. I don't think I did. I have to change that. All right, now those are our confidence intervals. Oh my goodness, you know what I think I'm going to have to do is film the rest of this, just the, when you're not here, and put it online. <laughs>